There we go. Good evening and welcome back to Smith Street Baptist Church on this Wednesday, cold Wednesday night. It's only 44 degrees outside. I don't know what the problem is. Uh, we're glad to have you. It's colder in the evening than it was during the day. So how about that for a change? Glad to have you with us this evening, uh, whether you're joining us live on the app or whether you're joining us here in the sanctuary. We're happy to have you both, but uh, we love you to be in the sanctuary. Forgive my voice. We've been singing and it's already been going. So it's, uh, it's going faster and faster as we speak. Let's pray together. And uh, while we pray, Connie, if you'll get me one of those, pep- those uh, long- lozenges, I would appreciate it. So. Father, we thank you for this time. We ask you, Lord, to be with us as we go through this message in a way that will open our hearts to receive it. And may the sicknesses and the um, distractions of life be put aside long enough to hear your word and to become doers of your word. Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for the privilege. We thank you for the praise reports we have. And Father, we lift up those who are sick, who cannot be here, those who are in rehabilitation, so on and so forth. And we just ask you, Father, for the, uh, to be glorified. We ask that you will work through us tonight, that we will glorify you in all that we say and do in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you like a ghost. Forgive me for having this in my mouth while I'm uh, speaking tonight. If you open up to Job chapter 5, that's where we're going to begin your readings this week. took you 5 through 9. We're going to go 5 through 8 tonight. It's more concise that way. And uh, and hopefully you're doing your readings. Um, and if not, I encourage you to do them. Maybe after tonight you'll want to go back and read a little bit to find out what we're talking about. But in Job chapter uh, 5 through 8, we begin the conversations that will actually take us through uh, the entire book of Job from this point on. I was a youth pastor, as you're flipping, I want to tell you a story about that. I was a youth pastor about 11 years ago. I had a youth member named Carrie, and uh, Carrie was a twin, and she was funny, and she was spunky, and she was beautiful inside and out. She had a great personality. I had the privilege of leading her to Christ and, uh, and assisting the pastor of the church at the time during her baptism service. And when she was 19 years old, she went down to Florida And a drunk driver ran into the car she was riding in, and she was killed. On October 21st of 2012, which was five years to the day that I was ordained as a pastor, I stood before her family and friends and officiated her funeral. She wasn't drinking. She wasn't living in sin down in Florida. She was out with friends, sitting at a red light, obeying the law, and her life was cut short. The drunk driver was the one who was wrong, not Carrie, but Carrie was killed nevertheless. When I received the news, I wondered, what? What could possibly could she have done to deserve this? What could she have done to bring this upon herself? And, And you've probably asked that question before, haven't you? You've said, what? You might have said, You might have been born, rather, with a disease, and you wondered, why me? Why have I had this? You might know of a baby who died at birth, and you you wondered, why did that happen? What did they do to deserve that? You might be doing all you can at work, and your boss is still a jerk, and you're wondering, what better or what more can I do to get past this jerky boss? What did I do to deserve being here with him or her? Maybe you give all you can in your marriage and your spouse doesn't. And giving all you can in your marriage and your spouse doesn't leaves you empty feeling. And you wonder, what did I do to deserve this? What did I do to to be in a loveless or a less than loving marriage? Maybe you suffer from depression. And you want to feel better, but you can't make yourself feel better. And you're trying to live out your life the best you can and honor God, but you're saying, why God? Why me? Why this? What did I do to deserve it? Well, it's true that we can make decisions in our life. Let's be honest. We make decisions in our life all the time that result in bad or have bad results. They have negative results, don't they? We do things all the time that, that can come about in a negative way. But sometimes tragedy and suffering are not always based upon the choices that we make. Sometimes they're based upon the choices that other people make for us. And so as we experience this tonight, think 
about what is it? What is it that in your life you've experienced and you've said, why me? This is not fair. This is not right. Why me, God? I've tried to live better. I'm living better for you. And yet this happened. Why? What did I do to deserve this event? We're not the first person to ask this, though. In fact, it's asked many times through Scripture. We're going to focus tonight on Job and how he asked this question. Last week, we looked at Job, who had everything taken away from him. Children, property, health, and wealth. At the end of Job 2, 11 through 13, we see where three friends of Job have heard about what happened to him. And so they travel to him to offer him protection, or comfort, rather, and, and provide that. Eliphaz was from the Edomite lands. Bildad and Zophar came from the lands that were further to the east. Your Bible mentions where. His condition was so bad that when they arrived to him, they grieved with him. The Bible describes some of the things they did to grieve outwardly, including sitting with him for seven days and seven nights and no one speaking a word. Can you imagine traveling a great distance to be with a friend who's going through a tragedy and sitting with them seven days and seven nights and no one speaking? Well, he was so beat up and just disgusting looking with the boils on his skin that he had scraped with pots. They were busted. They were pus, open, pus everywhere. He was in lots of pain. What could you possibly say to him? They probably, although I'm just taking a little liberty here, sitting there for seven days wondering, what could I possibly say to make this make sense? And then after seven days and seven nights, these compassionate guys, they begin to form their own opinions and share their own opinions with him. Chapter 3 is when the first words are uttered after those seven days, and that's Job. And Job is cursing his life. He doesn't curse God. He curses his life. He says, basically, I wish I had never been born. He cursed the day that he was born. In the next couple chapters after that, the first response from Job to Job for many of his friends take place. You'll remember if you read it that Eliphaz believes that Job suffered because he was guilty of his sins. And so he's focused on the response in his response to Job. Eliphaz is focused on the response of God to the wicked. In other words, he wants Job to see the error of his ways and make a change in his life. He doesn't know what Job did, but he knows that he needs to do something different. He needs to repent. He needs to change it. Because for him to get this punishment, he must have really messed up. He must have really gone too far. He must have really sinned on top of sin. On top of sin. And so in verse 8 of chapter 5, I think I believe it's 5, Eliphaz tells him that, yeah, this is why, chapter 5, verse 8, this is why if I were you, I would appeal to God. I would lay my cause at the feet of the Lord. In other words, I would repent and throw myself the mercy of the king of kings is what he's saying here. He has great intentions, doesn't he? Don't we sometimes have those intentions? We try to do that, we try to tell somebody what we think based on really an irrational uh, situation. Do you know what rational means? It means you have all the information. Irrational simply is the opposite. You don't have all the information. So when you are irrational, you are someone who is forming an opinion without all the information. I'll give you an example. Judge Roy Moore. Alabama, running for the Senate seat that was vacated by Jeff Sessions. Yesterday he was defeated by the Democrat Doug Stone or Doug Jones. Jones. Thank you. So Doug Jones comes in and beats him. A lot of people formed opinions about Judge Moore. Now I'm not telling you what to believe. What I'm telling you is I don't know because I don't have all the information. I only have what some people have said. But I don't have all the information. I have an irrational opinion. Just like that, Eliphaz and Zophar and Bildad had irrational opinions about Job's situation. Chapter 6 and 7 basically could be summed up like this. Job says this. Whoa! You're wrong. Back it up, buttercup. You have no idea what you're talking about. 
And then he talks to God a little bit. And as he does, as he cries out to God, he makes a reference in verse 12 of chapter 7. He makes a reference to the raging sea and the monster in it. And this is, so a little history lesson for you. This is in reference to the ancient Near Eastern legend that said when God created the earth, and remember in Genesis he separated the land from the sky, and he made this called the, the, the sky sky and the land land, right? So he separates this vast uh, void and, and makes the sky and the, the sea, okay? Or land and then the sea. So it's all there. Well, the ancient, uh, ancient myth says that there was this sea monster, and the sea monster uh, was named Tannin. And there was a sea god, and the sea god was named Yam. And Yam and Tannin didn't like that very much, so they tried to go after God and and stop him from doing what he was doing. And so what did he do? He put them down and captured them and stuck them back down to the sea and put a sandbar around them. I guess that's why when you go out in the ocean, it's really bad. Uh, it's because of the sea god and sea monster, right? Makes sense, doesn't it? It's not true. Just kidding. Some of you are like, yeah, yeah, I need to go read Genesis again. I missed that part. No, it's not in Genesis. It's an ancient, ancient myth or legend. But what Job was saying, and Job knew that legend. And what Job was saying was, I have not been rebellious to you, yet I suffer like they do. In other words, I didn't do this kind of rebellion. I haven't done anything. But God, you put me in the same situation or similar in that that you punished me. So then chapter 8, Job's second friend, Bildad, begins to speak. And he too wants to convince Job that not only did he have to have sinned to cause the suffering, but his children must have sinned as well because of their fate. So in other words, he continues to ask the question, what did you possibly or could you have possibly done to deserve this? You must have done something. You must have done something to deserve this punishment, Job. What could it have been? You had better, your kids did something, you've done something, and all your righteousness and all your your sacrifices for your family that you made at the altar were nothing before God because God wiped them out. That's what Bildad is saying to his friend. And Eliphaz and Bildad are like the people who believe that only bad things happen to people who are bad. Or, in other words, when the bad things happen, it's because I'm living in sin. Now, I want you to think about this in modern day. We live that way. We do. We live that way. Something bad happens to somebody, we automatically assume they must have been living in a way that didn't honor God. If something happens and someone's life is cut short, we must begin, we begin to ask ourselves, what were they doing? What were they living? How were they living? They had been, they had, they, 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 uh, they had to have pulled themselves out of that divine protection that God provides his believers. So he must have walked away from them or they walked away from him and thus they were sm- smited or smote. And, and what we do is, when we even do that when people don't die. We even do that when people are just in our lives and something bad happens. You're having a bad day, or a bad week, or a bad month. And you say, well, you must not be living right. Well, what does that mean, you must not be living right? I, I, am I no more a Christian because I have depression issues? Well, some people would say so in the church for very many years. For many years, the stigma of the church, and even today, is that if you struggle with depression, you must not really be a Christian, or you're not very strong in your faith. And we're going to talk in prayer in a minute about how that plays out into our prayer life when we accept uh, or when we know Christ better. But let's look at the facts real quick. Job was righteous, right? Job was right. We know that. In fact, we know more than Job or his friends or his wife. We know that God and Satan had a conversation in the arena of heaven that allowed for this to happen, didn't he? So we've got more information than does Job, who is there asking why. And his friends who are saying, you must have done something. And Job is pleading and saying, I haven't done anything. And they're saying, well, you must have done something. And it's going on and on and on and on and on. The result of this story is that bad stuff can happen 
And it's not always a result of our choices. Now, you're smart people. There's nobody in here who would disagree, I don't think, with the statement that when you make bad choices, you get bad results. Because we know we do, right? Get bad choices, you get bad results. But think for a moment. Back to Carrie. Carrie was not doing anything wrong. Was she perfect? Not any more than you and I. But she wasn't out drinking. She wasn't drinking and driving. She wasn't high. She wasn't doing anything that she shouldn't have been doing except she was out with friends, which we've all done and we will do again. She was sitting in a red light. She had her seatbelt on. A car plows in the back of them and her life is taken. That doesn't seem fair. But she didn't do anything to cause that. Because listen, if you're not careful, you'll live a life of fear. Because you'll always be waiting for the other shoe to drop. You won't go anywhere, do anything, or experience life at all that God has for you. Because you'll always be afraid that a car is going to hit you from the back. You can't live that way. You have to live as we have to live. As if today is the last day. But not in the world sense of YOLO, you only live once. we got to live in the way God has prepared for us to live. With an understanding that tragedy and suffering are not always based upon the choices we make. Sometimes they're based upon the choices other, people's make, other people make for us. Look, notice that I didn't say, there, I did in the, initially when I wrote this, I wrote sin. I want to pull sin away. I want to pull sin out of that. I wanted to say tragedy and suffering are not always based upon the sins we commit. Well, that's not true because when we commit sins, that can result in tragedy and suffering. and oftentimes does in some way. I didn't want to get confusing with the word sin. I want to put it in simple. Let's use the world's terminology and call it a choice. A decision. Now I want you to imagine for a minute how the rest of the world would be. Just imagine the rest of the world. In fact, don't even imagine the rest of the world. That's too big. Imagine the country. No, 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 the country's too big. Uh, imagine the state of Georgia. No, your minds can't handle that tonight. Imagine Vidalia. Can you do that? Can we imagine Vidalia? No? All right, Smith Street Baptist Church. Imagine the church here. All right, we'll, we'll narrow it. I can't listen. If I go any closer down, we're going to get into classrooms. So let's, and we'll offend people. So let's narrow it down to the church. Imagine how the rest of the church would be. If we would develop a faith, what's another word for faith? Anybody know? Trust, Trust, yeah, good. If we would develop a faith or a trust in God that was so deep that when bad things happen, we could move past the why immediately and begin the healing process instead of setting up camp in the why. Now, Big tragedies, sure, we experience that, and we probably have enough faith to get us through those. But what about the little things? What about when the person hurts your feelings, or the person forgets your name? (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) What about that? What about... The little things of life that cause problems. What about the lady who shoots you a bird at McDonald's? I saw on Facebook today where that happened to someone. Somebody shot a bird at McDonald's. Or the person who honks their horn at you as you drive by because you drive too slow. How about the person at work that rubs you the wrong way? Lies about you, steals something, stabs you in the back. How about when your spouse does something stupid and they hurt your feelings? Or your boss, who is normally a great person. In that moment, he does something or she does something wrong. Or what about the boss who's mean to you all the time? What about the debilitating disease? (coughs) Excuse me. Please. What about the debilitating disease that you've got that causes problems in your life? 
You got to get out of the camp of why am I here? And get into the camp of I know why I'm here. Because I live in a fallen world. Bad things happen to us. Sometimes they're small, sometimes they're big, but they're going to come. And the more we look for a reason beyond we live in a fallen world, the more we're going to camp out in that failure, camp out in that sorrow, camp out in that sadness. It's called having a pity party, and we're going to camp out there. (coughs) And we don't need to live there. (coughs) We don't need to live there. But how can we get out of that? Well, we've got to understand God. How do we understand God? Well, as best we can, because we can't understand him fully. And as is necessary for our point of view, we need to understand God enough for our point of view of surrounding circumstances to be brought into proper light. I'm going to take this into our prayer meeting in just a minute so you see how this connects. <coughs> That's my plan anyway. I don't know if I'll be going there or not, but that's my plan. To understand God, we've got to, or to know him better, we've got to pray, we've got to chat, and we've got to do what? Listen. Pray, chat, listen. You can make hand signals out of it if you ever want to teach it to children. I just made it up. I mean, it's not, it's not made up, but it's not new insight to the world, but it is to me. We've got to pray, chat, and listen. We've got to read, study, and learn. Read, study, and learn. And we've got to know, we've got to follow, and what? Obey. Now, I don't want you to remember those. I don't want to give you nine points to remember. I want you to remember one thing. I want you to remember that tragedy and suffering are not always going to be, in, uh, are not always going to be based upon the choices we make. But we will be affected by them. So when people come to you and they say, Faye, I can't believe this has happened in my life. This is going on, yada, yada. Why does God not love me any more than that? You can say, tragedy and suffering doesn't come from, always come from your choices. And that means that God's not punishing you for those choices. Well, what happens when I make bad choices? Those are called consequences. Okay, now let me show you how this plays out in our prayer life real quick. I want you to answer me back here. What are some things, in very short answers, not in long answers or drawn out stories, but very short answers, what are some things you pray for? Hmm? No, no, <clears throat> friends, yes, but what are some things you pray for for yourself? I should ask that question better. That was my fault. Thank you. What are some things you pray for for yourself? One word. I heard everybody answer and I didn't understand anything. <laughs> what did you say? Clarity, all right. What about you? Strength, all right. What about somebody? Health, okay. Huh? Patience, Patience. all right. Let me write some of these down. I got patience, strength, clarity, health. Going to have to unpack clarity in a minute. All right, what else? Forgiveness. Forgiveness? Mm, Good. What else? What else do you pray for? Understanding. Understanding? We're going to put that at clarity. Because I think that's what you meant, right? Okay. That's what we're going to unpack. Now, we don't have to. Earl unpacked it for you. Oh, you have? Oh, oh. Is this what you found? Well, understanding, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so we'll put clarity of... His voice. Okay, good. I'm going to tell you how to answer all these questions right here. Anybody else got one we pray for? I know you pray for more than that for yourself. What else do you pray for? You ever pray for... Uh... Yeah, we got that. That's good. A lot of people pray for patience. Good. Ooh, love. To love people. Cool. What else? Anything? Huh? Courage. Okay, Courage. You were meant to be courageous. Courage. courage. I tried to write courageous because I sang it. All right. <clears throat> Any others just on your tip of your tongue you just got to get out? All right. 
A Christian. Hmm? Humility. Humility. Good. All right. How about, other than the ones we mentioned, how about love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Those are good ones, right? How about those? I skipped a couple because they're already on the list. And yes, for those of you who had children or in children ministry or ever been in children ministry, I sang the song in my head as I called those out. I even did the little hand signs. So, now the question is, how many of these do you already uh, possess? Well, let's look at it. How many of you think that you already possess patience? Okay. Uh, Okay. Certain level? Yes. Yes. All right. How many of you think that you already possess strength? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many of you think that you already possess forgiveness? His forgiveness. Yeah, okay. How many of you think you already possess the ability to love other people the way he loves other people? Maybe not the exact way he loves people, but to the level that we could possibly love. Uh, Let's just say love other people. (laughs) Yeah, okay. How many of you think you possess the ability to be courageous? Yeah. How many of you think you possess the ability to be humble? Okay. How many of you think you have possess the ability to hear his voice and know it? Sometimes. We're going to unpack that in a minute. All right. For those of you joining us on the line, God bless you. You should have come tonight. Take care and we'll see you next time.